since the title of this conference is Friendship. Uh, so, uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Oresia Bila. I'm a philosopher. I always say I'm a teacher of philosophy. And Yaroslav uh, Ritzak is so and don't you dare to say that. You should say philosopher. And, you know, well, so I will be bold at this time. Um, and, um, um, uh, well, uh, our uh, guest today is Peter McCormick. Uh, and Peter is the author of many books, numerous books, but we had special occasion for this meeting. It's three books that have been published, uh, and one book, one more book is on the way. No, no, it has been submitted, but not yet approved. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, it takes we, will, uh, we will proceed in a way that uh, we'll talk with Peter about uh, his books and about his views, uh, about his philosophy. It's, uh, it's your chance, Peter, now to share some of your thoughts uh, that you wanted maybe also to add to these books, um, to, to give an introduction to them. Um, and uh, uh, our discussion is built in a way that we have a limited time of them, unfortunately, so we will have time for questions and discussions, but first, uh, maybe a few words about yourself. Uh, uh, Peter is a Canadian of origin, right? Uh, uh, but uh, lives today in Paris. Uh, and I always ask myself, can I, can I tell about you that you are a personalist philosopher, or would you oppose that? Well, uh, I don't think I'm a personalist philosopher. I'm interested in what, what and who persons are. But uh, to call someone a personalist philosopher usually identifies them with a tradition in uh, 20th century French philosophy, and I, I'm not part of that tradition, although uh, I was a personal uh, friend and a kind of assistant to Gabriel Marcel many, many years ago. And I uh, did my studies with Paul Ricoeur. Uh, both of those men were very sympathetic to some of the main claims in personalism, but uh, they themselves, certainly Paul Ricoeur would not identify himself that way. And I don't think I would identify myself that way either. That, that question you asked though, in this uh, most recent collection of papers, uh, in his own arms, there's a little citation on the back, which uh, is about the question of uh, who you are. If you want to identify me, or so, then you must ask me these questions. So uh, you might be interested not in reading the books, but at least in reading the back of the books. You know. <laughs> uh, you. So you, you taught in Ottawa, right? That's right, yes. I and was uh, taught in Ottawa for many years, about 30 years. And you were a member of uh, um, a Royal Society? I always, yes, Royal Society of Canada. Uh, and a permanent member of the Institut International de Philosophy in Paris. Yes, but that's for my sins. <laughs> if you become a member of these associations, you have to think twice why you have been asked to be a member of these associations. And clearly, the idea is that we hope that if we make McCormick a member, we can do something to change his trajectory because we're a little worried about it. Well, then we will. Uh, you, uh, I think being a Canadian is the destiny of being um, uh, in two worlds of English and French speaking. Uh, um, Philosophers, and uh, that's that's a big challenge also because English uh, philosophy is about analytics, it's about empiricism, uh, it's a long tradition of Hume um, and um, empiricism and uh, Oxford, and then the French philosophy is about what they call continental philosophy. I and mean, if you want to tease somebody, you say you are a continental philosopher. That means you can get a wide range of things. But your books are, this is about your books also. When I read, uh, when you see the titles, these are 
very creative titles. Uh, and uh, uh, still, it's a, it's, a, it's a philosophy that has very clear analytical uh, structure. You go through very serious, deep issues of justice and war and human rights and human dignity, um, emotions. Uh, how do you connect that poetry and philosophy? Why do you choose topics like that? What you, why, why do you choose the titles like that? Well, um, perhaps uh, you haven't seen the titles. The, the first collection, which Odyssea herself had, had worked very hard on to format this collection with several colleagues of hers and to bring it into print, thanks to uh, uh, Vladko Torchinovsky, who had sponsored these works and in the context of the uh, Institute, the International Institute for Ethics and Current Issues, which is always mentioned in the, in the beginning, uh, these works came about, so to speak. The first title, and this is what Arisi is referring to, it's called Of Three Minds, Essays in Ethics, the Political, the Social, the Global. Of Three Minds is uh, uh, not uh, obviously poetic, but it's clearly uh, not exactly plain speaking. We say in English, um, do you think, Blodko, it would be a good idea to publish a fourth collection of essays? And Blodko might say, I'm of two minds about that. Um, it would be good, but we have to find funding for her to know it. I'm of two minds, we say in English. But here, here is something which is of three minds. Why of three minds? Well, it's a citation from the work of a uh, prominent 20th century American poet, whom I happen to like very much, Wallace Stevens. And his little poem in which this line appears is called 12 Ways of Looking at a Blackbird. And um, he says, I was of three minds, like a tree in which there are three blackbirds. <laughs> so um, there's the first title. The second title is In the Moment of Your Passage. That's more poetic. Essays in Ethics, the Aesthetic, the Metaphysical, and the Interpretive. And the one that has just as well appeared last year is In His Own Arms. That's a little bit, that, that, that forces you in a certain direction, all events, actions, and persons. Now, I think your question there, Marissa, was, look, Peter, okay, there are some collections of essays, there are various items in here, but these are supposed to be philosophical essays, and the subtitles say that very clearly. So why do you put poetic uh, main title? Why is the book not called, the, the current book, why is it not called Events, Actions, and Persons? Why is it called In His Own Arms? In His Own Arms? What is this? So uh, I think you're calling for a, a certain uh, explanation of uh, an obvious puzzlement here. Mm -hmm. And I think you're putting your finger on something important here. I think what I would like to say about that is very little. It seems to me that much uh, work in English language philosophy today, whether it draws on history of philosophy or on current events or on traditions in England or traditions in France, particularly in Germany, whether it's inspired by Greek philosophy, whatever, much, much English language philosophy today is, I believe, um, inattentive to the extraordinarily, extraordinary richness of figurative language, of metaphor, and of simile, of images. The result is a kind of exaggeration of plain speaking. And here an historical footnote. You see, in the 18th century, in the development of the English language, John Dryden, who was a poet, but above all, a, a playwright, Dryden introduced into English what is called the plain style. And the plain style is shoot, they've left aside many of these figurative resources of language. And as philosophy developed, particularly in, the, in, in England, less so in the United States, 
what happened was that philosophers took over rather unwittingly this uh, the importance of plain speaking. Moreover, <coughs> many of those, uh, those interested in philosophy in the late 19th century and the early 20th century reacted against a certain Hegelianism, a certain types of a type of expression in English of, of Hegelian patterns of thought. And part of that reaction was stimulated by Russell, of course, and Wittgenstein, and G.E. Moore, who were interested in logic and philosophy of language. So that reinforced the primacy of the plain style. So today, unfortunately, I think, in some of the very rich works which continue to appear in the English language, whether they're written by English people or by Indian people or, or, or whoever, continue to, let's say, emphasize the importance of plain speaking. Mm -hmm. And they do well. However, they overlook some of the resources, some of what summons us to think in the first place of these poetic resources of language. Much of our interactions with each other are not matters of plain speaking. We talk with each other in a variety of different ways, particularly in broken sentences and imperfect constructions. And that, that is not reflected in the philosophical interests of most people working, even in the philosophy of language today. Some people in philosophy of language, of course, write about metaphor. But they don't use metaphors to write about the metaphor. And they're right not to do that. But at a certain point, they have to be wary. So, Risa, I'm sorry you got me started on that because I tend to feel strong. I'm not a poet, and that's a pity. But um, the new book of essays, which is under consideration, um, is called, It Was the Spirit That We Sought. Mm -hmm. The Spirit That We Sought. That's also from a Wallace Stevens poem, a very beautiful poem called The Idea of Order at Key West, in the one time, the idea of order, very philosophical, at Key West, Key West, what is that? Don't you begin to tremble a little bit when you say Key West in your mind? You know, I mean, it's the place we always dreamed of going, you know. Uh, some of us dreamed of going. So um, that book uh, also uses the same technique. It uses a poetic, the spirit of, oh, is, what is this, a religious? It's not a religious book, it's a philosophical book. It's the spirit. You say the spirit that we saw it at a professional conference in philosophy, and people start leaving the room. Right. You know, literally. I mean, it's just there's not much room for that way of talking. Let me see again. Um, I'm counting on you to uh, just to stop this. You know, well, what do you think about this response? Is that satisfactory, or, or do you? No, want I really. What, when I was um, uh, working with your books. Um, this, this was the first thing that I know, noticed about them, that, that uh, although you are an English-speaking philosopher, you, you think uh, like a, like a French-speaking philosopher. That's, that's, that's what really struck me. I mean, the metaphors, are they are working. And I, you know, I, today I was looking uh, for some connections between poetry and philosophy. And, and, uh, I found some uh, explanation like this. Philosophy and poetry have the same subject matter. However, philosophy is taking things rationally, and poetry take the, takes them dogmatically. And I could not, I just could not agree with that. Because I saw that poetry cannot be dogmatic, uh, in that sense that poetry has a lot of what we call semiotic gaps. It gives a lot of space for thought, for uh, for reader. So uh, for me, this was really I I find um, myself in, in this uh, poetic undertone and your um, rich metaphors uh, a space for thinking. And I think you are doing this well, also um, engaging a lot of uh, Greek uh, mythology and and Greek. Uh, uh, background. Now, in this last book of yours, which I already uh, said to you earlier, I really enjoyed, and I really, um, if, if you have not yet a chance to read that, please do so. I found there a um, great connection of you trying to um, talk 
about relatedness of emotions uh, and philosophy. Although we usually think that philosophy and emotions cannot be together, philosophy is very rational and emotions only distract us from, from uh, thinking. Uh, could you explain more about this? <laughs> well, um, I'll try to say uh, very briefly a word or two about that difficult topic. But first of all, Maurizio, it's very nice of you to say some of the things you've said. And I really appreciate it, and I appreciate your own work. I don't know whether some of you know Maurizio's work, but she knows a great deal about uh, French philosophy, particularly about Michel Foucault, on which she wrote her doctoral dissertation at the University of Guy. Uh, that's right, the University of Guy. And um, so when she talks about this kind of French dimension or this French and English thing, she's really talking from her own perspective, which is that of a Ukrainian philosopher looking at uh, some materials from France, particularly in the current period. And of course, she, she has a feeling for that kind of thing. So that's one of the reasons why I really appreciate what you said. So thank you for those comments. The, uh, I share with you that dissatisfaction you expressed with something else there that you'd read. Now, just a word about the uh, what has what had become up until maybe fifteen or twenty years ago. Yes, about that time, at least in the English language philosophical world. Again, it's important to distinguish between Great Britain and the English language philosophical world. The English language philosophical world is strongly Australian, for example. It's strongly Scandinavian. It's strongly a Netherlandish or from the Netherlands. So, you know, it's not that English is a world language and uh, French is not. It's just that there are many people doing philosophy in English, even though it's not their first language. Now, in Australia, it is their first language. In the Netherlands, it's not. Same thing in Scandinavia. So, when I talk about the English language philosophical world, I'm not talking about Oxbridge philosophy, the philosophy done at Oxford and Cambridge only. I'm talking about this larger area. Now in that context, up until about 15 or 20 years ago, there was a, uh, call it a strong uh, bias about the, uh, the proper, let's call it, cognitive worth, the, what kind of uh, uh, a source of knowledge, if any, could emotional states really be. And I think the bias was that traditionally, starting from Plato really, but even perhaps before that, there has been the sense that the emotions lead to confusion. They don't lead to clarity. The emotions are the kinds of things that are very difficult to put into words. We know when we're angry, we find words to express our anger. But to say exactly what the emotion of fear is, or to say exactly what compassion is. This is very difficult to do. So there was an artificial distinction that had become, we might say, uh, rooted in a, uh, between emotion on the one side and reason on the other side. Philosophy allied itself with reason, so philosophy was deeply suspicious of the emotion. Philosophers were different and deeply suspicious suspicions of emotion. And they acted out some of their suspicions. You know, philosophers are seen as cold fish. Uh, ask some women philosophers, and uh, they, they will confirm that for you, while at the same time saying, I'm a philosopher and I'm not a cold fish. I don't like being considered a cold fish, OK? I'm me, and this is the way of what I think about it. And I think about this because I think it's important. Gradually, people began to realize that rational states and emotional states cannot be separated so definitively. Most mental states include not just rational elements, but also emotional elements and other elements as well. So the separation between the two leads to distortions. That in a, just roughly is a starting point. Much more can be said, much has been said. There's some excellent work been done on this, but most of us today uh, even old people like me, we, we, uh, we find a sense of consolation 
we find our deeper instincts, which we never talk about in public, somehow are being uh, satisfied by this recognition that, yes, you can be a philosopher and still be emotional. I mean, it's, 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 it's very satisfying for some people who are completely out of control, like myself, most of the time, you know, I'm deeply satisfied. I don't have to give up philosophy. I don't have to give up my emotions if I want to continue to do philosophical work. It, it's, it's hard on my wife. She'd like to see me give up philosophy. But, you know, uh, I can be emotional about philosophy, too. Okay, you keep asking me these hard questions. I want to go on and on, but you've got to say, stop, Peter, stop. Well, uh, in your books, you, you write not just uh, theoretical things. Many of these uh, topics that you raise, issues that you raise, they relate to the current situation in Europe, in Ukraine. You also hear you write about Crimea, about Donetsk. Uh, you mentioned, uh, in the previous books, you mentioned uh, uh, Romanian kids. Uh, I think this thing we talk about, um, also there is uh, uh, many, many uh, things are said about uh, uh, European immigrants. Um, how do you see a relation between uh, ethics and the uh, not just theoretical ethics, but ethics in the real life. And I mean philosophical ethics. Uh, are we as philosophers owing anything to the world? Or what is the role of the ethics here? Hmm. Well, Arvisia, as usual, um, um, you have many questions there, and most of them are, I need a careful response. Uh, I think the issue here is, is a very central one, uh, and I'll get to it in just a minute, but let me say this in advance. It's very important to me as a philosopher, since some of your questions actually get back to personal issues, it's very important for me as a philosopher to say that on the basis of a relatively long life and uh, a fair amount of experience with philosophy, um, I happen to be uh, convinced that there's very little that one can, properly speaking, know. And I'm very deeply convinced that as a philosopher, when these kinds of issues come up, um, there's very little I can say that has much substance and uh, value. So uh, I want to make that explicit because I don't have strong views particularly about important matters. I'm filled with hesitations and doubts, and I, I kind of grope along. As one of the poets in my life says, uh, you know, a piece of philosophy is a momentary stay against confusion. I'm confused most of the time. And uh, the older I get, the more philosophy I do, the deeper I realize how little I know. And how little my opinions really should be taken seriously. So it's important that everyone recognize those very deep limitations of philosophical inquiry. And I'll come to that at the end of our discussion if I can. Now about practice and theory, yes, I think you point out rightly that there's a mixture of that in this work. And, and how do I see that? Well, let me generalize uh, rationally. <laughs> In a, in a rather storytelling mode. Um, people do philosophy for a variety of different reasons. And um, when students in the past and even friends have said, well, Peter, the question is not why do you do philosophy? I mean, everybody makes mistakes. The question is, why do you continue to do philosophy? You know, once you've got uh, vocational stability and you had tenure, so to speak, you're still doing it. You know, one would have thought you would have seen through the phoniness of philosophy by now and done something respectable. You know, you ought to, and not only that, you've aligned yourself with all these rich people. You see, you can only do philosophy if you're rich. Um, how many philosophers do you know in Burkina Faso? Oh, very few. You know, I, I've met some people there, but philosophy is a privilege most of us cannot afford. I mean, I happen to be born into a situation where my parents didn't have any money, and I don't have any money, 
but the society was such that I could uh, I would I could actually be paid for reading books and writing uh, readable essays and all of that. that that's Richmond's. Uh, that, that, that is a very unusual thing. I think philosophy for me has always started, as uh, John Dewey has pointed out, an American philosopher, when something in the ordinary uh, give and take of everyday life goes wrong. When something goes wrong, for me, it provokes me to reflect on certain things. But as I say to my students and uh, friends, uh, other people react to these provocations of everyday life when we lose our footing or we, we become uncertain about something or we doubt ourselves. They react to it in very different ways. So why do I react to it in what traditionally might be called a philosophical fashion? Well, I used to say to get my friends laughing a bit, it's because I have a, a genetic problem. It's basically genetic. That's why I continue to do philosophy, even though I don't think there's much to be learned from philosophy. And then they didn't like that, so it was at a too low a level of scientific sophistication because all the students know much more science than I do. So I said, well, I have a twisted protein. It's because of the twisted protein that I do philosophy. It's not my fault. And just like Socrates, you know, I think the state ought to take care of me. And the state does a pretty good job, you know, and I'm grateful for, you know, my handicap. What do you do? I mean, you know, I have to do what I have to do. But then I had to get serious because some of my students were feeling like that. So I think what uh, the Irish, Anglo-Irish poet William Yeats said uh, captured some of my feelings. Mad Ireland hurt you into poetry. Well, the madness of life, particularly the deep pathos of things, hurt me into philosophy. I do philosophy because I feel overwhelmed often by the extent of my confusions, the uh, inadequacy of my efforts to try to be at the disposal of other people. Uh, my failures to really return affection, my uh, self-centeredness, the uh, self-affirmation of so much philosophical writing, the assertiveness of it all. Um, that's why I do, I suppose that's why I try to start with these practicalities. And the practicalities that afflict me are the same ones that afflict you. They're all around us. And when I start thinking about them, then that drives me into the theoretical. But why pursue the theoretical? This is what uh, I think I owe to Dewey. You, you, you don't start with the theoretical. You start with the give and take of everyday life, where things are not quite what they should be, or what you think they should be. That kind of pushes you into a certain type of reflection. But then that reflection must not preoccupy you. You must take the fruits of that reflection and continually play it back into the practical. So there's this give and take between what gets you thinking, what are these interim results of your thinking, you try it out, that works well, oh, something else has gone wrong, and then that throws you into the theoretical again. So I see it as a, as a continually moving dynamic between uh, the immersion in everyday life with all of its joys and all of its sorrows and sadnesses, and this attempt to kind of, excuse me, make some sense of it. Mm -hmm. I know that's not very satisfactory, Alicia. I think you could pin my ears back for me if you go after let, let me ask you another question. Sure. What's wrong with the human dignity? I mean, when you talk about, about uh, um, European immigrants, we talk a lot about this uh, importance of uh, human life and personal dignity, uh, especially in the context of Europe and, and its new immigrants. So uh, what's wrong about this? What is that there that moves you that you want to point out? Let me try this out on you and see whether you'll be satisfied mm -hmm. or you're going to hit me with another hard question. The, um, Uh, in my idiosyncratic way, because most of us, when you really push us and when we reflect, we become very idiosyncratic and we become very particular. 
and we come to recognize that there are so many different ways of looking at these things. I'm confronted by my own poverty, my own dispossession, my own fallibility, my own confusions when I am forced to think about the immigrants. The immigrants for me, the face of the immigrant, is my own face. It's one I hide from myself. The deepest part of me is really my contingency. I don't have to be what I am. And, and this, not fallibly, but this contingency, there's nothing necessary about my being here now and my continuing to be here. That I find a revelation or a, a reflection of a profound dignity which is centered on something which I don't want to admit, which is my own impoverishment. Their plight is an externalization for me of my metaphysical situation. I am so deeply impoverished because I am a contingent reality. And that, or you could put it in, say, in religious terms, I'm a creature. I'm not independent. <clears throat> I, I'm not autonomous. I want to be independent. I want to be autonomous. I want to be my own boss. But in fact, I'm not. First of all, I'm embodied. So that means that I have to do with my awful hair. Today's a bad hair day. Or, you know, we have to deal with, with sickness. We have to deal with entropy. All of these things, it seems to me, touch on this question of contingency. So for me, um, I'm hopeless in the case of the immigrants. When I was a young man, I tried another attack. My attack was, as you pointed out to me today, one of the people here is very much of a social activist. For a while, I was a social activist. Can you imagine plump Peter out there, you know, kind of trying to help out the people at the port of Montreal, you know, the the down and out, as we say in English, the alcoholics, the schizophrenics, you know, the homeless, uh, those people. It, it, it was pretty bad, and uh, I was in the thick of it. That's why I quote Daniel Berrigan at the end, because he took me to Harlem and said, now, Peter, I want you to go around and do a, a census of what are the social needs of these people, all these black people from Haiti and so forth living in misery, until uh, I did what I could, until I almost died because a big man had, had strangled me. So I had to draw on my Boy Scout experience and break the stranglehold and hug him and <laughs> get across the street, you know, safely. The act of his life for me, I'm not suited for it, but that's where my heart is. So uh, all I can say then about that is that uh, speaking personally, Whatever thought may have a value is for me something that must be plugged into uh, the everyday nitty gritty, the world of need and uh, the world of want. It has to tie into that, no matter how abstract. Otherwise, it's abstraction for its own sake. And, and I see what that does to people. I see what it does to me. And I know many philosophers who are much smarter than I am and yet I flatter myself by saying, many philosophers are blind. They're blinded by their own intelligence. It's a paradoxical situation. They're so smart, they don't know what they're doing. And it's, it's, it's a tragic situation. I think the only thing that keeps a philosopher doing that, woman or man, man or woman, is the, the inexhaustible richness of everyday life. The kind of thing you see in the paintings of Pierre Bonal, just this sunlit room and an open window and the color here and there, nothing really important happening, and yet everything just throbbing and humming with life, which in the end is seen in those colors as an unaccountable gift that's there. It didn't have to be there, but it's there, and it's right there in front of you. It's there at the coffee break with those wonderful pastries. You know, I had two. It's shocking. So, you know, that's the kind of thing I, I, I see as getting to know people. One of the essays you 
afraid that without the metaphysical understanding of persons, the, ba the basic ethical responsibility of collective entities like EU, over refugees, or persons, and other persons cannot be properly justified. Okay, you better read that to me again. It sounds like an awful sentence. Yes. Uh, we should revise that. Uh, sorry. These are not books to be read. But very nice covers. You know, very nice yeah. covers. <laughs> Thanks to the people here. And, and, and something on the back, you know. The most you want to do with this book is look at the cover and read the back page, okay? <laughs> the first half of it, <coughs> the second half is in your The first half is picked out just for you, okay? I mean, uh, yes. you say, when you talk about... Uh, uh, ethical values toward uh, immigrants, uh, and uh, uh, it's a page 93. You say, for without a rationally satisfactory, non naturalistic, metaphysical understanding of persons, I do not think that the basic ethical responsibility of collective entities like the EU towards refugees and persons can be properly justified. Mm -hmm. Which, which uh, uh, we you were saying that we should step away from naturalistic understanding of persons and then to find new metaphysical understanding of persons yes. or return. But are we in the trouble here? I mean, uh, metaphysical, uh, for, for many centuries we lived in a Christian world where metaphysics were clearly driven from Christ's message. From, from the whole uh, Christian anthropology. Now we are in a world that calls itself post-secular, but I'm not sure this is a, this is a, you know, the, the right back, to, back to metaphysics world or something. We're still in the search of new metaphysics. Are mm -hmm. there, is there a ground for that? Well, this of course is a, um, a little more abstract question, so, uh, I'll be briefer, you know. <laughs> the harder the question, the shorter the response. <laughs> um, I think the, uh, at least in the intellectual world in which I've been forced to live, but I'm partly responsible for that, the reigning ideology, we might say, is what we might call a, uh, a scientific naturalism. It's, uh, in that sense, uh, Aristotle is the patron saint of that. Aristotle was a biologist and had a naturalistic view of the world. And of course, he was a philosophical genius. And uh, his work continues to animate a lot of that scientific naturalism. That is to say that everything can be ultimately explained in terms of, say, the physical laws that govern the universe. But of course, this kind of naturalism is sophisticated. That's the thing that we have to be careful about. It's not just that. There are many scientific naturalists, for example, who will admit to, say, non-material aspects of reality, who will concede that not everything in the natural world can be reduced to, say, law-like structures. And in that, they're just kind of uh, believing what they see. They're good naturalists. They see that the complexity of the physical world itself, take the, you know, uh, the way uranium emits radiation. Um, it's a very strange phenomenon, you know. Uh, it looks like an immaterial substance, you know, coming out of a material substance. Many scientists then, uh, thoughtful scientists, many philosophers of science, have a very sophisticated type of scientific naturalism. And that's why many philosophers, well, no longer today, but some 15, 20 years ago, were always kind of struggling with straw men. They had this idea that every uh, good scientist who's a naturalist is an atheist, you know, kind of excludes all, no, 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 this is silly. You know, that, that it doesn't do justice to the reality. There is a mentality there. Now, I want to claim that one of the things that so far has resisted uh, satisfactory scientific naturalistic explanation is the very complex phenomenon or phenomena of the person or of persons in the plural. And it seems to me that what is called for is a new metaphysical attempt to articulate 
what is at issue in the phenomena of persons that is not exclusively scientifically naturalistic. The idea is you don't reject scientific naturalism, but you have to say, in addition to scientific naturalism, we have to exploit some other phenomena here, other aspects of the, the, the problem itself. Put it this way, if something genuinely puzzles you, as my non-necessary status, my contingency, that puzzles me. The way you start, you start with the naturalistic world. You start with the everyday. You start with science. And you take it as far as you possibly can. By science, I also include here mathematics. You take it as far as you can. What you try to do is you try to solve philosophical problems, and historically, this is what happens in the early modern period, by subtracting from philosophy as many points at issue as you can hand over to the sciences for resolution. Here's a problem. We first try to solve it scientifically. It's only when you fail scientifically, after repeated, event, repeated attempts in community, the scientific community, it's only then that you can really authorize yourself to explore ex a non-exclusively naturalistic type of metaphysics. That's the direction I'm moving in. And I think there are phenomena, most people would agree, in not just personal life, but in our interpersonal lives, which cannot be satisfactorily <coughs> resolved so far, because clever naturalistic philosophers say, well, we can't explain this now, but in principle, it's explainable. That's a kind of claim that's very difficult to sustain. Look, if you can't explain it now, maybe you might explain it in the future because the science is wrong. But for the meantime, that means you're open to a non-exclusively scientific type of naturalism. That's the direction I want to see further reflection, some further reflection, at least my own reflection on what it means, what's at stake in my being a person. And it's there I think there is a, uh, I get excited about that, and that's what I'm talking about there. And in this uh, monograph, which I've just completed, and which is being evaluated not by my friend Blanco, it's being evaluated by another press, that, that book is on, that is a, a work in, in metaphysics, plus the metaphysics only comes in in the last two chapters. The first chapter is about disagreements between paleontologists and archaeologists on what's the difference between human beings and persons. And then the second part is about uh, the language of, uh, say, the not the early Neanderthals, but the, the middle Neanderthals. Uh, there seems to be a breakthrough in certain natural capacities. For example, the use of symbolic discourse that a whole central section that is exploration of other kinds of sciences, particularly linguistics. And then it's only after that those efforts are made that my dissatisfactions then propel me, so to speak, into metaphysical reflections. Okay, but Peter, what, what, how do you make sense of the question, the nature of person? What kind of a question is that? And let's not talk about the nature of persons. Let's not talk about essences, although I, I personally do want to talk about essences, as some other philosophers do as well. They were out of, out of uh, fashion for quite a long time, but they're back in fashion, at least in analytic metaphysics. Let's talk about the ground of persons. What is it that grounds persons? Is that the same thing as causes? No, it's not. Persons seem to have more than just causes. They have grounds. But what is the nature of these grounds of persons? You know, that, so that's an example then of how one is driven to, at least I feel driven to, trying to elaborate a non-exclusively scientific, naturalistic account of persons. You see, <laughs> it was it was meant to be. This is going to end. <laughs>
Shall we bring it to a conclusion? Not yet. She's really very difficult to know. I like her very much, and I think she really keeps pushing me to the wall. <laughs> this is this what is philosophy is doing. I mean, that's the last thing. Maybe we can close the windows so it's not Well, um, Or may not have locked. It reminds us of other things. Um, it certainly does. <laughs> you know, one of the uh, the things I was going to say for the, well, I'll save it for the conclusion. I know uh, this is not going to let us get to your questions, and we won't have time for many because we've run down the clock. And you know, it's like I learned this from the Prime Minister of England. There's a way of running down the clock. You know, it's not Brexit, we're running down, we're running down this session, the clock on this session. Shall I close the window? I'll just give it a try, maybe. Good, thank you. I mean, the Google is ready. That's a little better. Yeah, it's not very much. Thank you. When you will be tired, just say hello. Yes, Aurizia, if you want to. So, um. Question. I found that very interesting. Um, you talk here a lot about justice, uh, but you also, when you talk about justice, you mention something as a oneness and twoness. And you know, oneness and twoness have to be, it's hard to understand what is that, but that's from one and two. Uh, oneness it, and two. It's pretty bad, this book, believe me, actually. <laughs> no, it's interesting. It's interesting. Um, uh, every title, like a puzzle. So you have to get in that uh, text to understand what is it about. And I think one of the, uh, it's, it's actually about what the metaphysics of person, that you, yes. uh, you mentioned there a Japanese philosopher, but I think... Um, That's true. That, but I think it's not only about, I think for Eastern Europeans, specifically for Byzantine tradition, for Eastern Christians, that's also quite understandable concept of this. Tunis um, is about um, the person is never is never fully a person uh, on itself. Is that we become uh, a fully human being only in relation to each other. And here, what comes in my mind, the story about uh, Adam and Eve. Adam is actually a, a non-defined human being, and he becomes ish. Ish as a, a man uh, in a Hebrew, only when uh, Isha is made, mm -hmm. then they become two, and then you can uh, kind of mm -hmm. have a definition of a man and a woman. And before that, it's just Adam, like Adama is earth, and Adam is something that comes from earth, but he's the one. And so uh, this uh, biblical myth um, is returning always us to that concept that we are never a human being on our own. We kind of fulfill ourselves as human being in that relation uh, to each other, in relation to the other. Can you uh, tell more about this? Um, briefly, yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, first, an anecdote. Um, I, I had the, uh, the immense good fortune when I was a younger man to be invited to a, a small conference in Japan. The conference consisted of about 15 or 16 philosophers, and it was very interestingly composed. About five of us were, say, of European background, that's to say, North America, Europe, and different countries in Europe. And the rest were Japanese, with the exception of two Korean philosophers. And there was a split in terms of ages as well. There were senior philosophers who were older, and there were people in their early 40s, like myself at that time. And uh, there were lots of very interesting things about this conference. It was the finest set of conferences I've ever really experienced. Well, this invitation was uh, spread across 24 years. Very quickly, at the second year, the organizer of this conference, who had benefited from extraordinary, the gift of extraordinary resources, 
uh, decided on a, what he called a core group of five people. And in the core group, uh, there were two Europeans and three non-Europeans. And for uh, God knows what reasons, I was a member of that core group. The result was that I went to Japan every year for 24 years. And each time, it was a question of from 10 days to two weeks in these very intensive uh, discussions where all of my own presuppositions uh, were put into question just by the cultural situation. For example, for a, uh, a Japanese philosopher, when he's had his second and last glass of wine before he gets sick, uh, Japanese people uh, lack an enzyme for really uh, dealing with alcohol so they have difficulty uh, having more than one glass of wine. But after the second glass of wine, he would, uh, people would get excited, and these Japanese colleagues would say, you know, Peter, you have many defects, uh, but one of them is that um, you think there are philosophical problems in the plural, but there's only one philosophical problem. I said, I heard that before. I heard it from Karol Kojic in Prague. He said, the only philosophical problem is what could count as doing philosophy in times like these? I've never forgotten that. And I think Karl Kojin, in some ways, had a lot of things right there. Jeffrey said, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the culture of presuppositions you are ignorant of in doing philosophy. You see, from my Japanese perspective, there is only one philosophical issue. It's not a problem. It's not even a question. The issue is suffering. That is the, and that is part of the cultural presupposition of being a member of a Buddhist country. You lack that. You have other. You're very big on logos, Peter. You're really big on rationality. But that's a cultural presupposition. Well, we didn't get to the fourth or fifth glass of wine. It would be impolite. Now, that that experience meant that in the course of those very fruitful years of my life, I came into contact, we always had invited guests, and we had the core group, with somewhere between 250 and 300 contemporary Japanese philosophers, perhaps about 20 or 25 contemporary uh, Korean philosophers, no Chinese philosophers, very interesting. And in that course of that time, uh, I wound up having four life friends three of whom are still with me, one of whom has passed away. Um, And when you become friends in that context, then life opens out and your life changes. My life changed when I began to think about some of the things they kept saying. They said, look, Peter, you've got to get it straight. A person is not an individual. Do you hear that? A person is a matter of betweenness, I to God. A person exists in this middle space between two other beings. A person is a betweenness. That's the way we say it in Japanese. And it's in our grammar. Okay. We don't like the I, I, I. No, 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 no. It's the we, we, we. We know that that leads to terrible things. This betweenness, interrelationality, interrelatedness, that's the move I, move I made, but in English, not in Japanese. I don't know any Japanese, although I have Japanese friends. In my next life, I'll not only learn Ukrainian and Polish, but I will also learn Japanese. I'll be perfect. In any case, the, in, in, in that culture, thanks to that culture, I saw the promise of a not exclusively uh, scientific naturalism. I said, the idea of the person is really the idea of a betweenness. And then I found in all things, in one of the medieval philosophers, a crazy character, he actually had a, a reflection, a metaphysical a reflection, on a certain type of relation. And this relation had to do with the simultaneity of the two terms at the same time in the relationship. That's the betweenness. So that's the direction I'm moving in. I don't use the Japanese expression. Maybe I cite uh, the Japanese expression. It goes back to one of the greatest of contemporary Japanese philosophers. For a while, I edited a series in uh, modern in 
contemporary Japanese philosophy because of all these people that I met and wanted their work to get read, but then I backed out of that because uh, I'm not a specialist in that area. The only reason why the, this press had asked me to edit the thing was because I was not a specialist. All the specialists in modern Japanese philosophy, many of them hate each other. But since I was outside that, uh, that nexus of jealousies, I was kind of a neutral figure. Well, McGorry doesn't know anything, and he knows he doesn't know anything, so let him do it. So that, that, that worked out for everyone's advantage. It was a good thing. So I'm, uh, I'm di digressing again, uh, but that's the background there. And that's an example of a non-exclusively scientific naturalism. It's the betweenness, I think, which is one, but not only, of the not just essential characteristics of the person, but one of the grounding characteristics of the person, okay? That is a metaphysical issue, and it's one which I'm hoping to develop further in, in not just plain talk, but plain and figurative talk. Poetry points to these things, you see, and, and philosophers really struggle to grasp what the poet is pointing at, because the words keep, words, language is fragmented just like the will is weak and the mind is dark, language is broken. And, and part of the genius of poetry is to take these fragments, these tesserae, you know, and work them into some kind of shape. That's what Paul Ceylon does. And, and you see that. Uh, uh, and, and philosophers somehow don't see it often. They don't take it seriously enough. They think it's for those artistic people, the arty people. We're, we're, we're thinkers, but they're, you know, if self-indulgent. I think Chetsov would like to say something. I just wanted to point, it seems to me that, you know, um, uh, we all know uh, that, that very famous book, uh, classic uh, of sociology, Chrysanthemum and the Sword by yes, uh, yes. Benedict. And uh, she refers to that, exactly that problem of um, uh, uh, that in between this. She does. I didn't. I didn't realize that. I read that oh, book too many so you have to read that because it's 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 extremely important. She uh, she underlines and you know it was a report written for the uh, American government uh, on the Japanese uh, society during the Second World War. Yes. Uh, and that was the recipe how to handle the Japanese after the end of the war. And one of these chapters covers that exactly that that point. That is to say, uh, in Japanese, you don't have just one single uh, uh, pronoun for 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 me, for I. That's right. It depends on the context. It, it depends on the relationship. I can refer to to me by one pronoun, but if I am uh, uh, related to another person in a different way, I do not refer to myself by why, but but uh, by I or me. But I have another pronoun. So you are not just I, you are many different things depending on, on how right. you are related to, to, to that person. I'll and this, that. actually that metaphysical problem is, so to speak, discovered by the Japanese language, not yes. by the Japanese yes. philosophers, <laughs> but by the, the linguistic practice of, 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 of the Japanese. You see how humiliating it is to have good friends. Yeah. Cheslov is saying to me, Peter, there's nothing you know better the sun, right? You thought you had an idea, Peter, but she had it first, right? So give her credit. Probably it's a different, a different point, but, but uh, quite interesting. You it's know, great she, she wasn't that, a philosopher, but very good sociologist. Yeah, it's a beautiful book. That's, that book is still very valuable. And yeah. some Japanese colleagues, they still refer to that book, among other books like that. Marissa, what do we do? Um, uh, well, uh, since the uh, person is betweenness, so we also, there are also good. other people here who really want to engage in a dialogue, so we, we should let them in, right? Uh, maybe right. Yes. Maybe it's next. Yes. I'd like to return back to the previous question about natural sciences. And is the very nature of natural sciences to be empirical sciences? And the overwhelming majority of the knowledge gathered by natural sciences is an a posteriori knowledge. Yes. Uh, and it is very logical when natural scientists says that for a moment we cannot explain some phenomena, some 
some things in this world, maybe in future we will be equipped with new technologies, new techniques, and new approaches, I don't know. Uh, and we will be able to answer some questions. And it is logical, such an such answer, because it is fully in, uh, very methodological. But on the other hand, such an answer can be an answer in a sophist manner. Do not bother us with some questions which are not from our field. If we ask some natural scientist about metaphysical issues, they very often use to tell this kind of answer, which is not a pure answer. And if we come to very, very bold questions, for example, what blasted with this Big Bang theory? What was the origin of all this process? Well, they can still answer this question in some way. We don't know, maybe we will know. But if you try to ask them a metaphysical question, why did it blast? No, they tell you you are asking incorrect questions, claiming that your questions are not scientific in broad sense, not only for natural sciences. How to deal with this? Because the next question is how the consciousness appeared in this world. Consciousness which produced language, language laws, etc., etc., interpersonal relations. So is your question of how to deal with that kind of uh, because an the to true it answer the true answer uh, is very methodologically consistent. I think but one way to do it, it is sufficient. Ask your scientist friend. First of all, you're fortunate to have a scientist friend. Most philosophers don't have friends among scientists and uh, or among mathematicians either. And of course, friendship changes you, and and it changes philosophers often for the better. Now, about the uh, what to do with a person like that, uh, I have no idea. You would have to decide for yourself, but I know what I would do in that situation. Uh, I would simply say to the scientist, the uh, cosmologist, let's say, um, wh why do you think every question has to be put in the form of a problem? Right. Why is, is every question a problem? It, uh, a question has an answer, or at least it has a response. But a problem has, or it doesn't have, a solution. That's a very big presupposition. So not every problematic situation can be properly characterized as being a problem. If you generalize, you say, what are the problems of philosophy? That's not the way to put it. What, what, uh, what are the issues in philosophy? What are the questions in philosophy? Some of the questions do have a problematic nature, but not all of them do. And one of the the obstacles I think you run into, say, in free will and determinism issues, or mind-body problems, is you put exactly the relation between mind-body in the form of a problem. And then, if you cannot sketch the form of a possible solution, it's a pseudo-problem, and then it's to be dismissed. That, that, that's a, what a problem means to a scientist, is that we know what any solution to that particular issue. We know the form of any solution to that particular solution. We don't have the solution, but we know what form the solution should take. If we cannot specify the form of solution to that type of issue can take, then it's not a problem. It's something that it's not my field. You know, I just excuse myself from thinking any further about it. That's a mistake. It's a presupposition that needs to be challenged in those types of discussions. At least, you know, there's much more to be said about that, and you especially could say much more about it. But that, that is just a, a quick response to that. I object to the idea that every philosophical issue is a problem. I don't think that's the case. And I think uh, the, the result of taking that particular view is a real contra excuse me, a contraction, which really falsifies and distorts the reality you know, that is summoning us to somehow or other come up with a response. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just, just ask you, 
Peter, listening to you, I, I feel all, consider all these reflections rather challenging and also in, in some way convincing. Would it mean we have to rewrite at a certain moment in a very critical approach, say, the modern or the, the history of modern philosophy? Because, I mean, critically speaking, you could also say, if you put it in a very general way, philosophy was taken by the scientific paradigm. And probably, I mean, even to be a little bit self-critical to our, say, as a philosopher, we could say, yeah, and we took it. We took that we were taken, and what we, were, what we did, we were struggling, so to say, to save our place in the university and to be accepted. Yeah, yeah, yeah in a way, I, I overdo a little bit, huh? I overdo a little bit, but isn't this actually what, what now, what you are doing and what you are gratefully doing with all your essays and so on and so on? Opening up the curtain again by trying to say, not interrupt the dialogue exactly with science in its naturalistic uh, paradigm. So, I mean, you know what? Because if we look back a little bit, say, say to the ancient philosophers and so on, emotions, psychology, and so on and so on. This was, I mean, they did not give answers. Not everything was problematic. At least they pointed at it. And they took it as a serious issue to be reflected seriously within philosophy. Mm -hmm. And hence with philosophical terms. Mm -hmm. But we gave up to do that. I mean, it was even worse with, with theology. But, but, you know, and social sciences, including so psychology, to a large extent, followed the same line. And therefore, all of, a, all of a sudden, we discover that issues like conscience, like respect, like dignity, what you call the crowning, the crowning, huh? I like this term very, well, very much, huh? this all of a sudden disappears between our fingers, or we try again to describe it exactly in the way that you, dis, that you just were asked you the question, please, Give me the, the problem of it, and if you can't define the problem, then actually it's something we cannot talk about. Well, I, was, I, I think that's a very generous and overly, let me say, charitable uh, <laughs> hearing of what it, I've overheard myself saying. No, I, I think I, I, I really uh, don't have any uh, such uh, views or competence about the history of uh, modern philosophy or the history of philosophy itself, what I, I, what's important to state is that we must not shortchange the sciences, and particularly mathematics. Yeah. Uh, we yeah. know that we're very deeply indebted to sciences, exactly. but it's because of that scientific orientation since the 17th century that philosophers themselves uh, have very much come into the debt of the science. It's not that science has distorted philosophy, there, there, there have been many positive uh, uh, results of scientific inquiry for philosophical reflection. And, and I didn't say that. I was focusing on, you know, yes, but there is this piece of, of course. And, and that's part of the, the distortion in this type of a discussion. Uh, let me say this much. Um, I have no program. Uh, I'm interested in certain issues. Uh, most of these essays have been generated, not by me, They've been generated by Flutgo and other people who are kind enough to invite me to a conference and say, all right, Peter, the topic is fake news. The topic is post-truth. What do you think about that? Where's my head? I don't know anything about post-truth. Then he says, the topic is friendship after Facebook. What do you think about that? I don't think anything about that. So, okay. Well, you're not coming unless you write something. These are what are called topical pieces. The, the, the topics are dictated by friends, colleagues who say, please, we, we'd like you to participate, and uh, we know it's a bit of an imposition, but here's the theme. You've got to write about this. So most of the stuff I'm writing about, this is important to recognize, particularly about justice, these are not topics I've chosen. They've somehow or other been the themes which have been proposed by colleagues in conferences you know, to which I've been invited. 
And some of those have resulted in papers and so forth, and I've tried to put those out there. So if you say, well, Peter, do you have a program? Um, I wish I did. I, it's true I'm interested in this kind of non-exclusively scientific, naturalistic metaphysics, and that's been exciting to me, but I wouldn't call it a program. I do have one thing I'd like to say, though, before we have to quit, and maybe someone else would like to say, is there something, someone else would like to say something here? I haven't responded to you appropriately there, Alois, but um, uh, I owe you a good glass of wine anyway, so we'll, we'll get to it. Is there someone else who would like to say something at all? Just, uh, you know, you can say whatever you want, and uh, it doesn't have to be a question. It can be what we call in English an expostulation. It could be an insult. It could be uh, whatever you want, you know. It could be just a twitch, you know. But if you want to make yourself heard, or if you want to try to get a point across, or if you'd like to especially get after Blutko, who's responsible for all of this, you know, he set this thing up, I mean, you know, and, and, and who got dragooned into it, or and myself, you know, we're stuck, we have Blutko's idea, this would be a good idea to have a session, really? <laughs> would anyone else like to say something before we uh, rush for those remaining crumpets that are downstairs, those delicious uh, things? No. What do you think? Or is it, can I? Um, yes, uh, well, you, want to you, say. Always, you always write this for, for those young ones, right? Those what? The, for all those studying ethics and contemporary issues. Here is more, not any more young ones, but here, I remember that because Are you I'm talking about me or right? something? Right. For younger know. scholars and students of ethics in Ukraine, but here and even also in Eastern Europe. Um, can you share the, in your final um, conclusions also what what are we really having uh, in ethics? Uh, okay. Uh, what what is the road there? What okay, here's the road. Again, another uh, story. Some years ago, Blutko invited me to uh, give a to participate in the extremely well respected and very very successful uh, philosophy summer schools here at Ukum. And I had to decline the invitation. And then he asked me again, and I had to decline again. And then I said, well, um, I don't seem to be able to be free enough for those summer schools in philosophy, although I love teaching. I haven't done much teaching in the last 15 years or so. Maybe I can offer these essays. Well, what is the point of the essays? The point of the essays is to make available, mainly, to uh, students and to younger uh, academics, people who are at the instructor or assistant professor level, a series of affordable, cheap essays, which are probably wrong-headed, which will probably stimulate them to disagree. The idea is to put those out on the table and say, look, this is kvatch, right? Now, now, why is it kvatch, you see? And they'll get thinking about it and say, you know, McCormick is completely wrong about immigration. He's completely crazy about this issue of justice. And what he says about two-ness and oneness, I don't care whether he quotes Plato, it's simply wrong, okay? He didn't get it right. He gets nothing right in these essays. He just goes on and on endlessly, and you know, here's the way to look at it. That's what I want to hear. That's what I want to hear. Because here in this post-Soviet society, in a time of terrific geopolitical risk, in a time where these problems are so great, problems of climate, immigration, you know, problems of the disappearance of species, all of these terrible things that are happening to us, you know, we live as Bill McKinnon, one of these Ecologist writes, we live at a moment of loss. That's what we're living in now, a moment of loss. And what is called for in a moment of loss is many things. Not only patience with ourselves, but can we, as just a community of human beings spread across here, can we really succeed in saving the earth, saving ourselves? I don't know. Things don't look good. But if I, at least 
if I can put on the table something that might provoke people because of its wrongheadedness to think for themselves, that would be lovely. But certainly coming from outside Ukraine, not knowing the language, not knowing the history, uh, having a completely different culture, having a Northwestern European mentality, you know, knowing a lot of ancient Greek but never having assimilated, you know, a Byzantine way of looking at things, it just, I don't have a sense of it. You know, my liturgy is not your liturgy, okay? And, and here I am coming in from outside, I'm saying, you know, here's something for you people in Ukraine to think about. No, 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 no. There's nothing in these books that, uh, you know, put it this way, there's very little in these books, despite the nice words of Rizzi that you're going to agree with. If you don't disagree with it, then, you know, you're not working hard enough. You've got to sit there and say, this is not right for these reasons. And as soon as you do that, then you're in the conversation. You've got to get into the conversation with each other. This is my gesture towards uh, Vlodko and the rest of you, the summer schools in philosophy. That's what I did. And, and that's how these things have originated. Now, what do I have to offer? I offer a spectacle in these books. This is a dramatization of how wrong-headed some well-meaning individuals can go. You read some of this stuff and you say, you know, in one of the essays I quote that about poverty. Poverty is a deeper issue to me than immigration. Remind yourself, Peter, every day, philosophy bakes no bread. You got that, Peter? Philosophy makes, bakes no bread. Philosophy is poor. Philosophy is poor as a church mouse because reason is poor. Because, as I was saying, in that Augustinian spirit, let's not be Jansenists, but the mind is dark. The will is weak. Language is broken. Okay? There's very little clarity we can bring into our lives and certainly into our actions. That's why philosophy is so poor. Philosophy bakes, it does so little, and people think it can do so much. Look at religion, look at art, look at history. These are so much richer pursuits than philosophy. Philosophy, it's not your fate, but it's mine, okay? And that means you've got a chance to go your own way. I've already gone too far, and what I've come up with is kind of disillusion. I wouldn't put it that way. But there is, as there is it pointed out to me in a conversation, there is a note, a pervading tone of sadness in this work, which is a reflection of how little philosophy can do to help us somehow or other lead a decent life, put it that way. How little philosophical ethics can help us lead a decent life. This is poor stuff. And you can see it if you get into it. That's what I want to say about that issue. So let me just try to bring this to an end, if I can get around Marissa. She's anti-child. She's very difficult to deal with. She keeps insisting on things. Uh, Arissa, let me just take this one thing from the back of In His Own Arms. There is an essay in this book, the book that the collection that came out on compassion. I don't like talking about compassion. I don't like talking about most of these things. They embarrass me. It's my Irish background, okay? I'm kind of shy, you might say. I like to hide. Compassion is a difficult matter for a philosopher. I want to say something like this. The experience of compassion does not seem to be satisfactorily understandable in scientifically naturalist ways only. See, that picks up on the thing. Rather, understanding compassion would seem to presuppose a causally open understanding, not causally closed, causally open understanding of some elements of experience as a whole, not as a part. For scientists, you know, the world is causally closed. Okay, there are causes. The openness at issue here 
in partial view sometimes only in the very structures of fictional human and divine persons, seems to surpass the reach of philosophical ethics itself. That's the poverty thing. Yeah. Philosophy is, is a poor man's thing. Perhaps this openness surpasses, too, any finally merely philosophical elucidations here in this book. That's stressing all the point, always the contingency, the fallibility, you know, the littleness of philosophy. If somebody's a philosopher, pray for her, pray for him, okay? <laughs> for what seems to be at stake in talk of openness here, what is at stake in that? Is willingness to answer, are you willing, McCormick, to answer a fundamental and always recurring question? And here's where I quote this icon of my youth, my misplaced youth, my wasted youth. This icon was Thomas Merton, who was a, a Cistercian monk and quite a man about town before he got religion at the age of 27. He was a big man at Columbia and so forth, uh, quite a character. He writes, if you want to be, if you want to identify me, this seems to be part of the openness I'm talking about. If you want to identify me, Merton's version of that fundamental question, what is openness, went. This was when he's trying to cross the border. He's trying to come from Poland into Ukraine with a French identity card. You need a French passport. You know, so trying to get across the border. And the border cross up, who are you? If you want to identify me, he says to the border guards, gets them all upset. If you want to identify me, Burton's, ask me not what my name is or where I live. Ask me what I think I am living for. Ask me in detail. And secondly, ask me what I think is keeping me from living fully for the thing I want to live for. And before this session, I said to Arisa, Arisa, if you ask me this question, you say, Peter, what do I think I'm living for? If you say, tell us in detail what you think you're living for, Peter. <coughs> I won't answer the question because I, I don't think I can answer that question satisfactorily to myself. I have an idea I can, but I'm not sure I can. And suppose you went on to ask me that, or I said, what do you think is keeping me, Peter, from living fully for the thing I want to live for. I think I could ask some, I could, I could give you a shot. I'll tell you what's going on. Doing philosophy is key. That's what's going on. So I'm ending this thing not on a pessimistic note, but I'm saying watch out. Watch out for philosophy. If it gets to you, make sure your friends pray for you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>